Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Roberto Simon. I'm a senior director of policy at America Society Council of the Americas and the head of our anti-corruption working group. We're really thrilled to have this all-star panel with us today. Uh, but before uh, I present them, let me go through some really basic logistics. This discussion is on the record and will be available online afterwards. Uh, we will have time for questions and answers at the end. So if you have a question, please use the chat box on the right side of your screen. Uh, we're very thankful to CFA, Control Risks, and Cleary and Gottlieb for their generous support to our anti-corruption group. Um, we're hosting this panel as part of, of the launch of a series of case studies that we did on anti-corruption in Latin America. I'm going to ask my colleagues to share the link to the, to the web page here in the chat. Uh, one case study is about the Angle Commission in Chile, and, and, and the commission was created following a series of embarrassing scandals, including one uh, involving the son of President Bachelet and a commission that unleashed a wave of reforms in Chile. The second case study is about corruption at the local level in the Peruvian Amazon, looking at the envir environmental devastation provoked by corruption and how anti-corruption enforcement outside big cities is still very rare and, and, and hard in Latin America. And we did this case study with Proetica in Peru. And lastly, we look at the rise and fall of civil society driven anti-corruption push uh, in Mexico during the Peña Nieto years. And all these case studies, they basically confront the same questions, which are what can make countries in the region really take a step forward in the fight against corruption? Who can lead and who can undermine progress? Uh, and when do we face a window of, of opportunity to pass really major reforms or to see major investigations moving forward? And now I, I think it's worth asking, could the pandemic be a window of opportunity for us uh, to really really push forward and, and pass major uh, reforms in Congresses across the region and see new enforcement action emerging uh, across the region? Uh, as we face this enormous challenge now with devastating healthcare and economic consequences for the region, and we look back uh, to the last five years where anti-corruption has been really the driver of elections and political crises and, and all events in the region. Is Latin America in a, in a better position to fight corruption than uh, we were uh, five years ago? And to discuss this and other questions, we have, we're thrilled to have Eduardo Engel, who's the professor, who's a professor at the Universidad de Chile, is the director of Espacio Público, and he served as the chairman of the Presidential Commission on Anti-Corruption created by President Bachelet. We also have Jose Ugas, currently a partner at Benitez Vargas and Ugas Abogados. He's the former chair of Transparency International, and he was the ad hoc attorney for Peru in the big investigations against Fujimori, Montesinos, and others. And we have Viri Rios. Viri is a political analyst and a researcher at Harvard University focusing on Mexican development. She previously served as a commissioner with Mexico Sistema Nacional Anticorrupción and was the founding CEO of NGO Mexico Como Vamos. I want to start going around the virtual room with the same question to the three of you. Thank you all for, for being with us today. And the question is really you know, a, a broader question, which is how COVID-19 is really impacting the anti-corruption space in your country and also regionally. What are, if you had to you know, mention two or three big takeaways for you, with the pandemic after seven months of pandemic, what are they? And, and are there opportunities for, for big reforms? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? I want to start with you, Vidi. Again, thank you all for, for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Roberto. It's great to be here. Uh, so uh, I think uh, you're asking a critical question, not only for Mexico, but for Latin America. Um, I would say the pandemic has profoundly transformed uh, Mexico and the region. And this is mainly for two reasons. One is the economic crisis, crisis that uh, was created by the pandemic. Basically, that in the case of Mexico reduced government revenues quite significantly. 
uh, the government, uh, specifically the government of Mexico, has refused to increase public debt uh, in order to cover the losses uh, of public finances. Uh, and therefore, uh, the only alternative that they have presented to Mexican uh, public, to the Mexican population, has been to implement a radical policy of austerity. Uh, this means less money for almost everything in Mexico. And when I say almost everything, well, that includes, of course, anti-corruption policy. Um, ironically, and this is something I have written also in my column at El País, um, corruption, at least understood as bribery, has uh, diminished during the last couple of years and has diminished also during the pandemic. Um, it may be that behind this, uh, this uh, reduction is, is the same reduction on public uh, spending. So when you have less contracts, when you have less capacity of spending, when you have a, like a strong uh, policy of austerity, of course there are less uh, areas, there are less moments where the government can uh, receive briberies or conduct uh, contracts on, on ways that are uh, particularly corrupt. Um, now, a uh, second part of your question is whether there could be a uh, reform, right? Like, uh, is there an opportunity for a reform in the case of Mexico? I would say no. Uh, and I would say no for a couple reasons. One is um, political. The president of Mexico believes more on willpower as a weapon to reduce corruption rather than as changing institutions. He's really not a reformer, an institutional reformer. A reformer. He has a majority in both in both houses, but has barely reformed uh, anything. Uh, he's asking his uh, team to violate procedures if those procedures are not, are corrupt. Um, but he is not really changing the procedures that he thinks that are corrupt. So it seems that uh, the Mexican president believes that corruption has actually ended. Uh, because he and his team are, according to him, honest. Uh, of course, the honesty of his team has been called into question uh, because we have seen, recently we have seen some videos showing his brother uh, receiving money from past campaigns, so it's, it's so clear whether his team is more honest. And the second a reason why I think we are not probably expecting a reform is, is more strategic, uh, Roberto, and it's that uh, an anti-corruption policy has been left behind on the agenda. And the most immediate and urgent action that the country needs is, is health policy. And it's probably also a fiscal reform to get more resources. So unfortunately, I don't see Mexico right now standing on a moment of strong anti-corruption reform. Thank you. Let, let me throw the question to Jose. Jose, what are your views from, from Lima? Thank you again for being with us. Well, thank you, Roberto. Good morning. As usual, complex uh, situations like the pandemic have very negative impact, but also open some windows of opportunity. I understand that that is the sense of your question. On the negative side, I would say for Peru, it has been devastating. We are the number one country with uh, the highest level of deaths per 100,000 people. And uh, this has to do with the informality of uh, uh, the jobs in this country, and also the disorder we have with public transport and markets. I would say those two, two spaces have been very clear in the reason why Peru has had such a bad performance at the beginning of this pandemic. On the other side, as many other countries of the region, the weakness of our health and education system and the economical system, of course, has been exposed in its worst picture. And the collapse of the hospitals and then all these issues with uh, the kids that cannot go to school and they depend of internet connection, but they don't have access to the technology because they, most of them or many of them come from poor uh, uh, families that don't have phones, intelligent phones, or they even don't have in the rural areas access to the signal of internet. So then you have dozens of 
of children walking around the mountains to try to find some sign of and sitting there on this uh, uh, climate uh, to try to, to have some uh, input on their education. So on the negative side, this has been very bad and probably the worst scenario is that at least 3 million Peruvians have gone back to poverty. Peru has been doing a serious effort in the past decade to take people out of poverty. Most of them went to informal work, that is true, and that's why in two or three months, three million people went back. And uh, now they are in a very precarious situation. So I would say this is on the negative side. On the positive side, and I would say I'm always optimistic, it's difficult to be optimistic in, in this environment, but I'm still optimistic. I think that there are three possible situations that can move forward the anti-corruption agenda. First of all, if we, and I think we are going to have a challenge in Peru and in Latin America in the next years to tackle the issue of inequality and poverty. It's gonna be there. It's, it's impossible not to look at it. Probably in the past, we were trying to evade this situation. Now it's gonna be there. It is there right now. And I think that if we link the issue of inequality and poverty to anti-corruption, then we can open a new, a totally new, I would say, unexplored uh, path of tackling corruption with a human rights perspective. The Inter-American Commission of Human Rights has been working on this. They just released a, a paper on December on grand corruption and human rights. So I think this is, uh, very, very interesting, and I think it will open a lot of expectation of how can we uh, fight corruption from a human rights perspective. I, I, I believe this is something that can come, and we certainly are working on that here in Peru. The second uh, window is the possibility of generating a new narrative of corruption, because it's so evident now that corruption is the cause why our hospitals are like they are, or education is in the situation it is, or the economy in a country where billions of soles have been stolen in, in, the, in the past decades. I think that it is a great opportunity to create a new anti-corruption narrative, to talk to the people and show the people the real consequences of corruption. Many times people don't uh, think it's, it's so clear who are the victims of corruption and how corruption is impacting in their daily lives. And the third thing I believe opens a, a totally new window is the introduction of technology in the fight against corruption. How do we control uh, spaces? And uh, I think we can talk a little bit more about that in, in the next questions. Great, let me bring Eduardo to the discussion. Eduardo, what's, what's the view from Santiago? the pandemic, um, only a bit better than Peru. Chile began being very proud of having of the common belief of the good handling of the pandemic, but things were out of control nearly. And by now, if you look at the statistics, Chile is among the top 10 countries in death per capita. Um, and even if you correct for the fact that some countries have not as good data, still the performance has been um, a major deception, especially if you take into account that Chile, usually when it comes to quality of institutions, to governance, was among the, or still is among the top two countries in Latin America together with Uruguay. So the expectations were that Chile should have done much, much better than it has done. And part of it is, is related to our health system having had a disappointing performance. To a big extent, Chile had a municipalization of its health system, and when it came to coordinating the system on the preventive side, it just did, did not work. Um, there's been some improvements, but still, um, I think this will lead to a major rethink of our health system. There were reforms pending, and I imagine now we're going to have the wonderful opportunity to do that. Then. Um, I'm understanding here, so Jose was optimistic on the side of 
looking for a new narrative for corruption. I will look at corruption in a broader sense also to be optimistic, which is corruption is a manifestation of weak institutions and often what you need is reforms that strengthen institutions. And I think that what we're already seeing with one specific example in Chile is that countries which have increased their debt dramatically, which is the case of Chile, um, also Peru and Paraguay, which were the three countries which could um, borrow a lot. Other countries would have loved to do it, but no one would have lent to them. Um, will have the problem that they have to pay back the debt. And that means that ministers of finance and governments in general will be interested in doing the sort of reforms they don't do usually, because they need the money. And one of the big pending reforms in Chile was the public procurement system. Chile was a pioneer in Latin America. 20 years ago, approximately, we began Chile Compra, which was very innovative at the time. But then we started lagging behind. Other countries leapfrogged or ahead of us. And this was a sort of reform no government wanted to do, because it's a lot of work at the beginning. It takes a couple of years. Things are not going to work that well when you change the system, improve it. But eventually, you save the government lots of money. And that is partly corruption, but partly also just not very good management. So both going there together. But this is related to quality of institutions and to um, saving lots of money for government. So this is now a project from the government, is in Congress. There have been two or three of these initiatives before, and nothing has happened. But I think that this will be an occasion where this will go forward. And it will go forward simply because the government is now very interested in being more efficient in how it spends its money. And whoever comes in the future, we have elections next year, will be as interested as well, because the debt will continue um, being there. Another issue which has come up in Chile, which I think also is going to lead to some soul searching and to reforms eventually, is how we manage public data. Um, the statistics on the pandemic have become part of the political discussion because they have been um, managed not with technical criteria. Part of it is that the pandemic caught us by surprise, but part of it is also weak institutions in public statistics. Chile is a great central bank and all the macroeconomic statistics, no one would ever doubt their numbers or that the date you elect to inform them has anything to do with politics. Well, on the side of health statistics or more generally, um, the National Statistics Institute in Chile is still politicized. There's a project in Congress which has been there for six years and which has made some progress but has not been approved yet. And I think that in the wake of this pandemic, um, quite a broad coalition will say it's time to pass this project, it's time to take this data out of the political discussion. Um, you can have your opinions, but you should, you should all agree on the data we have. So I think that's another element of which I would be optimistic as well. Great, thank you for that. Let, let me stick with Chile for a second. And Chile is, of course, on the brink of, of a major referendum to potentially initiate a, a, a new constitutional process, right? Yes. What is your view? Is it a good idea uh, for Chile to, to draft a new constitution? In terms of anti-corruption, what's at stake here? What are the risks uh, in this process? Well, I think that Chile had um, an outbreak of social protest um, last October, which led to a month of violence, but at, at the same time of the la la largest Pacific rally in Chilean history. The only thing that compares to that was a rally a week before the plebiscite in 88 that voted out Pinochet of power. Um, so um, after that rally on October 25th, which was really impressive and had representation from every part of society on the streets in Santiago, I think that the political world center left and right concluded that the best way to channel all that desire to participate, to start resolving this crisis of representation, which I think is at the heart of what's going on in Chile, was a new constitution. There had been a process along these lines. Bachelet and her government, the same um, speech at which she announced the commission had the honor to preside, she also announced a process for a new constitution. She always thought of these two as being complementary to each other. And the constitution began with a process, 200,000 people participated in local events to discuss what they would like, but 
all she managed to do was leave a project before she left power because the opposition was not interested in drafting a new constitution. I not only think, but they've said it in public, they would be really happy if they had drafted that constitution, which Bachelet and the process she, she saw. I think she had the right intuition at the time of what the country needed. Unfortunately, most leaders did not see it, and now we're doing this situation, which is is more complicated. Um, but I think that the constitution, that um, the process that begins is a process which is positive in the sense that it's the best alternative to channel the desire to participate and to begin solving a crisis of representation in Chile. The political system was just not doing the job of um, listening to what people wanted. And one concrete example, Chile was a pioneer in having a pension reform where you have private saving by every individual. And when people started retiring on this pension reform, this happened in 1980, but it takes a lot of time till people start to retire on this. In 2015, pensions were much lower than what people had expected they would be. And it's five years after that, and we still don't have a reform on how to improve the system. Um, it is clear that the system has things which should be improved and that's what should remain in place, but the political system um, has been a failure in five years in resolving this, and you have millions of people now retiring with very lower pensions, often 30% of the last earnings, not 70%, which is what they believe they would be getting. And then you have um, other people whose parents are in that situation, and they must now chip in. So in terms of people being unhappy with politics, this is broad-based and is, is a problem. So I think that the constitutional reform is necessary and important. How does this vote for corruption? In the short run, and you look at the data, there's no clear correlation between constitutions that were changed and corruption indicators. I looked at this three, four years ago, and in some cases, corruption goes down. In other cases, it continues the same, and sometimes it increases. So I think there's no correlation. But what these reforms do, and I think, I hope it will do in the case of Chile, is redistribute power in society. They lead to a new social contract. And I think that, and hope that in that new social contract, you can have, hopefully, um, a scenario where some of the groups which will um, make it difficult to have reforms in terms of corruption lose some power, and therefore you have uh, a, a more level playing field, which will also help then reforms which can make um, control of corruption better in the country. Let's, let's move to neighboring Peru. Um, Jose, I think we, we, we just saw another botched attempt to, to unseat uh, President Vizcarra or a president by Congress. Um, the, the political news in Peru have been, has been driven by anti-corruption. We have a bunch of former presidents facing accusations, one committed suicide, etc. Lava Jato has really torn apart the political system. And now we're slowly heading towards a new presidential election in six, seven months. Sense in terms of political volatility and the risks here uh, of what may happen for a new election, what is at stake here? In the end, do you think uh, this anti-corruption spring may lead the country to a, a, a trap in terms of, of the, its electoral system and a new government that may reverse some of the recent gains? What, what, what is your take? Uh, first of all, I think that the political crisis we are going through is not caused primarily by, by the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic is a big issue here, but when we had a poll, a national poll, in the middle, in the worst moment of the pandemic, two and a half months ago, and the Peruvians were asked, which do you think is the worst problem of this country? 57% said corruption, and only 38% said pandemia. So imagine this, people were dying all around the country, hospitals were collapsed, and people were clear that the main problem of the country was corruption. So I would say that the problem this government is facing is different from the previous ones because Vizcarra 
has not been involved in big issues of corruption. Remember, Kuczynski has been linked to Lavajato. The accusations against Kuczynski are linked to Lavajato. And the same happened with Mala and Toledo. Toledo probably the worst case because he's already proven that he has taken uh, around $30 million of bribes uh, on, on this case. And Alan Garcia was going to be investigated also for corrupt practices linked to this. He was quite uh, near to one of the Odebrecht's representative here in Peru. And Fujimori is in prison, convicted to 25 years because of corruption. In the case of Vicara, this has been an affair that I think exposes the precarious situation of the political system of, of my country. And uh, this has to do, I, I've been seduced by the arguments of Stephen Levitsky, a Harvard professor who is married to a Peruvian woman, so he knows quite well uh, the country. And he says, the problem of Peru is that don't have a professional political class. And this was shocking for me because I've been fighting the political class for so many years that my dreams were we should disappear the political class. But then he brought me to reality and say, when you don't have a professional political class, then you have all these suicidal groups like the one we have in Congress that don't matter on the future because they don't have future. They don't, they don't care to make a career on uh, politics. So they want to be there for the five years they have been appointed, take as much as possible. I didn't care about the future of the country. And this is a drama. And I think it has a lot of reality on it. So on one side, yes, Peru has huge issues of corruption, and that's the negative part of the picture. But at the same time, I think we are the country number one prosecuting and generating consequences for the corrupt, uh, even more than Brazil right now, I think. Uh, all our last five democratically elected presidents have been sitting on the bench have been in prison and are still linked to this investigation. So I believe that the future of the country is going to be clearly marked but by, by the anti-corruption agenda. This is going, we are going to elections in, in April of, of this year. So uh, this is going to be, of course, as usual, on the top of the agenda. But the problem is that since we don't have a good political class or we don't have a political class at all at this point, the offer of candidates is going to be so bad that probably will be worse than in previous elections. We will have populists there, and of course, many of them link to corruption. Some of the candidates that have been announced already have investigations of corruption pending on their side. So uh, I think we will have uh, uh, a lot of these issues on the near future. Uh, what is going to happen with the anti-corruption agenda? Probably Toledo is going to be extradited in the following months from the United States. I think his case is one of the most clear cases with a lot of evidence there. Keiko Fujimori is going to run for candidate again for this election. And uh, the prosecutors are running to try to arrive to an accusation before the end of this year. So we will have this weird situation of a candidate like Keiko with probably an accusation of money laundering and corruption uh, with uh, many years of conviction pending over her head. Uh, so I think the corruption environment is going to be entangled, entangled with the election process, and this probably will generate some a lot of more confusion in the following months. The parallels here with Brazil are inevitable for, for the Brazilian moderator. The big the, the, the candidate facing big accusations with prosecutors moving fast ahead of elections. And, and, and I think you're, you're right. I agree with the assessment that now Peru is really the country leading uh, investigations and enforcement much more than Brazil. And by the way, we conducted the CCC and the capacity to combat corruption index this year that clearly showed that Peru was the only country in the region compared to last year that was, that had made some progress uh, compared to Brazil, Mexico, and others. Let me go to Vidi also with a question about the link between anti-corruption and politics in Mexico. 
Also, the news have been uh, uh, evolving fast in Mexico with the Lozoya case, the former CEO of Pemex, uh, who's now apparently collaborating with investigators. Uh, we also have a debate about doing a referendum on prosecuting former presidents. And at the same time, you have many analysts saying that you don't need a, a referendum to do that. Uh, but how do you connect these dots under the new AMLO environment, Vidi? What, what is the, the scenario here, both in terms of enforcement, you're, you were very skeptical about reforms, but when we look at these investigations that are moving forward, what should we expect? Also in terms of the Odebrecht case, other major cases that we've seen that have not been investigation, they investigated in Mexico. What, what is your view on that? Um, Lozoya is Mexico's, oh, can you can you hear me? Yes, okay, perfect, sorry. Um, Lozoya is Mexico's former Pemex chief. Um, uh, federal prosecutors have accused him basically of three things, uh, bribery, criminal association, and money laundering. Uh, to reduce his penalty, he's trying to testify, and he's gone until he has already testified against uh, former President Peña Nieto, some important members of his cabinet, and also a long list of uh, opposition congressmen in Mexico. Uh, now, uh, the issue here, as you mentioned, is that this has been quite politicized. In particular, Lopez Obrador uh, refuses to investigate Peña Nieto. Uh, he first wants to conduct a national referendum. And this national referendum, uh, uh, he thinks he needs the legitimacy to do it. Uh, this national referendum, it, it's unclear whether it would happen because the Supreme Court, Mexican Supreme Court, is currently deciding whether it may be unconstitutional. The main reason why they think it's unconstitutional, uh, I personally think this it's a good argument, is that what if the referendum says no? What if Mexico decides, the Mexican people decides that Peña Nieto uh, should not be investigated, right? Like that's not something that you should decide on a referendum because then it becomes a political decision, like like accurately you you said, Robert, right? Um, so um, just this morning, uh, President Peña, uh, President uh, López Obrador said that if the court declares this referendum unconstitutional, uh, then he's going to present a reform, a constitutional reform to Congress. Remember, he controls both chambers of Congress in Mexico uh, in order to change the rules of referendum such that it is possible to conduct this. So uh, to conduct this uh, consult, public consult. Now, um, what does this show, right? And I, and I think this is the main lesson, not only for Mexico, but for Latin America. Well, this shows something that we already know and something that is not exclusive to Mexico. In Latin America, anti-corruption policy is and has always been a political weapon. Uh, it is a weapon because corruption is widely spread. I'm, I'm talking right now on the case of Mexico. So when a system is corrupt, entirely corrupt, the decision of who, what politician, what political party will be accused first becomes a deeply political decision. Lopez Obrador is taking advantage of this situation. Is deciding that the referendum is going to be about a certain number of people. He actually, on the question, he wants to have the specific names of people that he thinks uh, could be um, judged and could be investigated. Uh, and he's, for example, not deciding to use a state to research cases like his brother, right? Well, he said it's going to happen, but the name of his brother is not on the referendum, of course, right? Um, so I, I think we need one of the main challenges of Latin America in general, and of Mexico in particular, is to figure out a way to fight corruption that is less political. We will never have an apolitical anti-corruption fight, but we, we need to move into a, a, a type of reform that is less, politic, less, less politicizable. And on this last point, uh, we already have one question from the audience, which is how how much autonomy do you think 
the Attorney General in Mexico, Gertz Manero, has to really prosecute the Lozoya case? I wouldn't be uh, very hopeful that he is uh, uh, completely autonomous. Uh, again, I, I don't think there is a 100% autonomous institution, people, prison, like everybody has its own, uh, you know, even personal preferences. Uh, but what we have seen, uh, at least in the case of Gertz Manero, is that he seems to be uh, very aligned with the agenda of President uh, López Obrador. Actually, just this weekend, he had a long speech explaining why the government of Peña Nieto had been the most corrupt government in the history of Mexico. Uh, so with, uh, I, I would be surprised. I want to be surprised uh, of his independence, but I, I'm not sure. Just as a reminder to everyone here participating, if you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A or the chat box. We're checking both. Um, Jose, let me go to you with also a question from the audience. One of the case studies we have is about corruption at the local level in the Peruvian Amazon and how basically when Lima was on fire with major prosecutions, a bunch of former presidents you know, facing very tough accusations, we went to the Peruvian Amazon and we saw that we, we encountered a prosecutor trying to do the right thing regarding a major corruption scheme uh, on, uh, related to land trafficking that was leading to uh, uh, deforestation across the, the forest. And, and he wasn't able to move forward because he was facing all kinds of uh, barriers like a, a completely partisan Ministerio Público and also you know, a very strong business elite of Madereros and others who could control him in a way that was kind of impossible for him to do his job. The question here is about really investing in um, a professional body of public servants, career people as a way to control corruption. And I remember speaking with with uh, uh, a minister of of, uh, of uh, or the president of the Anti Corruption Commission in the Viscata administration. She was saying that one of the main goals of the anti corruption reforms that the government was proposing was to really try to promote trained and and career people uh, within the government bureaucracy. Um, how is that in in Peru? Do you think the Peruvian state will will be able to increase its capacity moving forward? Is it something that it's feasible? What, what are your thoughts? Well, there are a lot of things to say in this point. First of all, uh, corruption in Peru is systemic, like in most of Latin America. So it's a structural problem. It's not uh, just uh, something that happens because you have a bad president or a corrupt political party. Look at our history and corruption has always been present there with significant levels of penetration on the public administration. There's a very good book written by a Peruvian uh, uh, professor called History of Corruption in Peru or Corrupt Circles in English. And the conclusion of the book is that in the entire history of my country, there hasn't been a low cycle of corruption. All the cycles have been high or very high. Secondly, I would say the appearance of organized crime in the way it happened in my country, we are a producer number one of cocaine in the world. And this, this was a game changer. All these cartels coming into the country and funneling money here and organizing the way of exploitation of coca leaves had a terrible impact in the Peruvian landscape. So the penetration of organized crime has been huge. And uh, uh, cases like the one you have researched uh, regarding land trafficking, drug trafficking, illegal timber, illegal mining, those are huge powers and they are all around the country. And of course, they come with a lot of corruption linked to them because they pay judges, they pay policemen, authorities of all sorts in order to make possible their illegal business. So this is, this is a huge problem. Uh, the other way of looking at this has to do with the process of decentralization in Peru. 
Peru was a very centralized country. Lima was everything. If you went out of Lima, you wouldn't find infrastructure and people was mostly living in rural conditions. Uh, uh, and then we decided to dis decentralize power. But we decentralized power and we didn't decentralize control. And we decentralized power with very weak institutions. And of course, corruption flourished all around the country in a way that hasn't been seen before, because suddenly a lot of resources appeared, uh, were delivered to these regions, and they were taken uh, through different corrupt practices. So it is a complex uh, uh, vision of the future, because this combination of structural corruption, organized crime, and that's why uh, I believe personally that we need in in as a priority to tackle grand corruption, because of course, we also have a lot of petty corruption here. But in our agenda, because of this encounter between organized crime and uh, grand corruption, we need to prioritize the strategies because this is a structural problem. So what should we expect in the future? We need to prioritize political reforms. And that's part of the issue. There was a package of political reforms regarding uh, financing of political parties and uh, election rules and uh, education and justice reforms. Uh, for example, now we are on the eve of the appointment of the new members of the Constitutional Court. And we are not having the problems Guatemala is having right now with their Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court and Congress. But the Constitutional Court here has been, as in, like the Guatemalan, very relevant, stopping a lot of abuses and unconstitutional decisions. So if co Congress has been running to try to this Congress before elections to appoint their favorite candidates, and that could be a problem. So we need to put in place this set of political reforms. I believe Vizcarra tried to do it. That's why he got in clash with the Congress and he has not succeeded totally. Some of these rules have been put in place, but still there's a lot of new uh, rules that need to be put in place in order to uh, increase uh, the, the strength of institutions and uh, the rule of law that is so needed in the political in political terms. Mm -hmm. I want to go to Angle with this question about political or anti-corruption reforms and how you sell them politically uh, to public opinion. Eduardo, following the, the, the commission that you chaired, we saw Chile approve the wave of, of uh, legislations on a variety of topics from party transparency to the independence of electoral courts and more related to anti-corruption. But when we look at the data regarding perception of corruption or whether people feel represented by the political system or political elites, usually we, we didn't, we, we haven't seen much change, right? Um, what is your explanation to that? And how can, is this kind of the big trap for anti-corruption reforms? Because it's something that it's not, it's intangible. People don't feel it uh, in their daily lives. And how, how do you manage this, this problem? You hear me? Sorry. Yeah, yeah you were. After the reforms, we have had some major additional scandals, and of course, people are not, uh, they don't look at the laws that are approved, they just see what's happening in their daily lives. So we've got a major scandal involving the police, and more recently, a scandal involving generals of uh, pretty much most of the generals in the army of Chile with a scheme which is not huge amounts of money, but which really looks bad. Essentially, all the trips, they would buy the most expensive business class ticket of first class, and then they would change the ticket to a normal ticket, a normal price, and the difference would go into their private bank accounts. And this was done for like 20 years by most generals in the army and things like that, which of course, for, for everyone, but especially for people who are not into the technical details, it's very easy to understand as being really corrupt. So one issue is that new scandals emerged after these reforms. So that's one factor. Um, on the other hand, if you look at 
specific things that were reformed, people are aware of it and, and I support them a lot. So for example, political campaigns in Chile now are much more transparent and there's a limit on what you can post on the streets and they tend to be more informative. And there was, I mean, political parties initially were very much unhappy with this and had this whole argument that there was not a political atmosphere during campaigns. Till there was run a survey and 82% of people approved the change and then political parties stopped complaining. Um, so there's been support there. But now more interesting and coming to what's happening in the last year in Chile, um, Chile for the first time has for the last three years public um, financing of political parties together with private monies. But before that it was only private money. And you've seen some changes which I think are important what's happening in Chile the two main parties on the right, one of them had essentially, the president of the party was the one who put the money, according to all press analysts, Mr. Carlos Larraín. Well, now that the party has money independent of who's the president, he's stopping the president and the new president, which has been there for the last two or three years, has been one of the leaders of the right, which has been much more receptive to what's happening in the country than other people on the right. So it has allowed for one of the major parties to start listening to its constituents and not to those who are financing it, which is, I think, a major change. This is Mario Desbordes, um, who's been one of the few new leaderships to emerge after the um, Estallido Social last October in Chile. And I think that has only been possible because to be the president of a party now, you don't need to be the guy who's puts the money personally as it was, or is in contact with those who finance the party. So in that sense, this is positive. And now think about things to come for the process which will come now in Chile with a number of elections, which will lead to a new constitution with high likelihood. I mean, all polls say that um, the, the plebiscite will approve, yes, the question is what's gonna be 60, 70, or 80% of votes. Um, you will have a much more transparent process. And, the, and I think one of the main challenges of this new constitution in Chile is not only the product itself, but the process that leads to it, that it be a legitimate process. Um, people care not only about the letter of the law, but also the process that leads to it. And this, in that sense, the reforms which were approved three, four years ago in Chile will help make this a more legitimate process in the eyes of the people. Great. We have another question. This one is from my colleague, Brian Winter, to Jose. Do you believe the anti-corruption wave is still growing? And I think Brian refers to the wave that we saw following Lava Jato, La Linea in Guatemala and so on. Or has it been successfully damaged by accusations of lawfare and the mistakes and miscalculations of some prosecutors and judges? Well, I think it's undeniable that it has been affected. What happened with <clears throat> Moro and, and the Lava Jato tax force, I think has had a negative, and I would say strong impact in the advancement of the cases. If you add to this, the issues with the Bolsonaro government and Congress, that makes it worse. Uh, in Peru, I won't say there has been uh, such an relevant negative impact because still here the attorney general's office has a uh, uh, good reputation and credibility. The attorney general has been accused of being linked to Vizcarra and to one of the criminal networks of judges and prosecutors that are being investigated. That's, that's something interesting too, because in my country, a uh, criminal network within the judiciary and the prosecutors was, was uh, uh, detected and they have been taken into justice. Right now we have a Supreme Justice uh, pending extradition in Spain and uh, different presidents of courts and magistrates are in prison right now and prosecutors are responding to these accusations. So uh, I would say that it depends in each country of the credibility of the system. And I think in Peru still judges and prosecutors and particularly basically because of the reputation of the prosecutors in charge of the Lava Jato case, uh, judges and, and prosecutors are still uh, regarded by the public opinion as good public officials that are doing their work. 
uh, in, in past December, on the eve of the new year, the former attorney general who was a corrupt and he had to resign, tried to uh, dismiss the young prosecutors who were investigating the, the Lava Jato case. And people went to the streets on the 31st of December at 11.30 on the night. And instead of partying, they were claiming and defending their uh, prosecutors and judges. So yes, lawfare, this type of uh, guerra judicial, using cases uh, uh, to attack your political opponent, generates some lack of confidence. I believe that in Brazil, the country is divided totally in two. People that believe in Lula and Partido de los Trabajadores, they believe that Lava Jato is an invention to harm them. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, you have the other 50% of the population that believe that there has been significant corruption in this with political uh, consequences. Uh, I don't think we are in that situation in Peru. So for me, there's still a space and it will depend how the prosecutor, the attorney general, and the, the Supreme Court will conduct in the, in the following months regarding their independence from the political <clears throat> uh, authorities. And if Congress is going to intend, again, to, to try to control the judiciary and the attorney general's office, it's not happening right now. But of course, the Congress is willing to do that and to attack them and to try to tie them uh, but this is this will depend, I, I believe, in what's going to happen with elections in the near future. Vidi, a question to you on uh, which enforcement agencies in Mexico are functioning. But I wanted to to complement and, and look specifically at the WIF, the Financial Intelligence Unit in Mexico that has been kind of the, the AMLO years in many of these investigations that we're seeing. And if we look at the frozen accounts and, and action taken, uh, it has really spiked under Santiago Nieto. Um, but there are also many, many uh, accusations of uh, kind of a partisan approach to investigations and the fact that Santiago really reports to the president himself has participated in press conferences uh, along with the president and himself is becoming a much more political figure. How do you see this tense equilibrium um, and, and what, what is your assessment exactly? Um, well, again, I think we need to put this in context because I'm not sure that the complaints are coming completely unbiased to the activities of the WIF. The, the WIF, uh, for those that are in a little bit more of context, is uh, the institution in Mexico that battles money laundering. Uh, and, and the WIF has been used hand in hand with uh, Mexican IRS, the SAT, uh, in order to conduct an unprecedented effort to tax corporations and the rich in Mexico. Uh, what we have seen is literally unprecedented. Let me give you an example. Mexico uh, on 2020 uh, is actually um, taxing more, is actually collecting more taxes than in 2019 and than in 2018 and basically than in every single year in history uh, because for the first time uh, corporations are paying long debts that they have uh, to meet the Mexican IRS. So complaints come partially from this uh, new activity that the WIF is playing uh, on tax laws. Um, some people claim that this is a risk for rule of law because uh, you know uh, the WIF may um, extra limit its mandate in order to increase tax collection. And well, um, of course, the rich are going to complain about this. Mexico is a country where uh, uh, where tax evasion uh, is pervasive. Um, it is actually uh, there. There is an interesting study that shows that about uh, at least three points of the GDP are evaded in taxes every year. So of course, when you put these institutions to work, you're gonna get a lot of complaints. I personally don't think this is a risk to the rule of law. I think tax evasion is a risk to the rule of law. Um, so I am I'm, I'm a little bit more critical of that, of that interpretation. Now, uh, let me say something, Roberto, and with this I wanna close with I, Mexican IRS 
uh, the anti-corruption system, the Congress, every single institution can be used with political purposes. This is not about whip. This is about how and whether we create checks and balances for institutions in general. And here, the way to go is not just to say we should not have a strong anti-laundering institution. In my point of view, the way to go is say, well, uh, we should have a judicial system that works in case uh, such that uh, if the WIF is misused, um, any single Mexican, everybody can have a proper legal defendant, um, you know, uh, t taking the case. Um, but well, this is more of a structural issue, I guess, and it goes back to our conversation about how every single anti-corruption uh, battle in Latin America has been politicized. Thank you for that. I think we have time for one last question. Um, I'll go to Eduardo. And the, the question is about polarization and, and the cost it imposes on, on institutions over the long run, particularly when it comes to the rule of law. Uh, I think for all the three countries that we're analyzing here, polarization is a, is a reality. And for all countries in Latin America or in the hemisphere, um, are there solutions, institutional solutions that we should be looking at to reduce polarization of prosecutorial bodies, of courts? Um, what are the, the answers that we should be thinking about? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think we still don't know very well how to deal with the new technology. Um, we've made some improvements in Chile. There's TV programs which look at fake news and do fact checking. In fact, Argentina is a pioneer. They have a whole method which they then export at very low cost to any other country. Special Pulido together with CNN Chile did this program. There are many more doing it now. Um, the press has a role there and people are working on that more. I think that. There's a major role there for civil society. Um, I think that there's more polarization among political leaders than among, within civil society. There's much more polarization on Twitter and other sort of social networks than among civil society. And I think there's a vacuum there, which at least I see in Chile, a lot of action on the side of civil society on with a new process for a constitution, for a new constitution on contributing that people talk about this, that this is a moment to reach broad agreements. It's not a moment to impose your preferences on the rest, but to talk about things. And I think civil society has begun to play an important role in the process that begins in Chile in October. There's a lot of interest and a lot of pressure by independents to become um, candidates to the constitute to the to the body which will write the new constitution. The government has announced that it will make the playing field more level so that independents can participate. And the independents which are interested in this are really, I think, much less into the polarization logic and much more into the logic of finding instances where you listen to others, where you talk to others, where you reach broad agreements, which is what the constitution and then should be about. Great, so on this more positive note, let me thank all the participants. It has been really an amazing discussion. I think we covered a lot of ground on a really critical topic. I encourage everyone to take a look at the, the case studies and all the work that we've been doing at America's Quarterly and with the Anti-Corruption Working Group. Uh, thank you so much. This, this uh, discussion will be online, so please feel free to share it uh, with other people who are interested in the subject and hope to see you all very soon. Stay safe and, and stay healthy. Bye-bye, thank you.